Welcome everyone. Good morning, good day, and good evening, depending on the time of day in your part of the world. Thank you for, the, for those joining us live and to those listening to the taped presentation. I'd also like to warmly welcome our expert panelists, which we will introduce to you very, very shortly. The FIP webinar today is entitled Enabling Multiprofessional Prescribing and Administration for Improved Uptake Rates. It's a very important area for pharmacy practice and patient care and an area of my own interest and one that I'm extremely passionate about. The webinar today is focused on the Western Pacific region. My name is Ron Goose. I'm a pharmacist, a former regulator, and assistant professor coming to you live from Canada. I'm also the past chair of the Canadian Patient Safety Institute and past co-chair of Healthcare Excellence Canada. I'm currently the Canadian consultant for the DOT Pharmacy Program for the United States-based National Association Boards of Pharmacy, and for the past 16 months, the chair of FIP's Regulators Forum. In today's webinar, we will have a panel discussion on vaccine prescribing and administration. We have assembled a panel consisting of healthcare professionals and policy leaders, some from which are outside of the profession, and will present their thoughts and participate in discussion on this timely issue. This is not just about the recent and still current pandemic, but really a broader picture of vaccinations. In many countries, vaccination coverage rates are suboptimal and vaccination services are largely focused on childhood. Critical goals to expand vaccination pathways include having more and more easily accessible vaccination points, more, prof more professionals who can deliver vaccinations to a greater number of people, and open access to those living in remote and unserviced areas. However, equally important is access to evidence-based advice on vaccines and vaccinations. This event will discuss the drivers, the barriers to interprofessional understanding, cooperation, and vaccine task sharing within the areas of the Western Pacific region. Additional information will also be provided regarding the regulatory authority and oversight granted in different healthcare professionals to different healthcare professionals to prescribe and or administer vaccines within that region. We have a lot to talk about over the next 90 minutes, but I'm only one of the moderators of this webinar today. Without further delay, I will introduce, you, introduce to you my co-moderator. Parasa Aslani is the co other co-moderator for today. And Dr. Aslani is a professor of medicine use optimization at the University of Sydney School of Pharmacy. She is currently deputy head of the school and director of academic career development. She's a fellow of FIP, currently the FIP vice president and immediate past president of the health and medicines information section. Parissa has been a researcher and educator in the field of consumer medicine information and adherence for over 25 years. Before I turn the web webinar over to Parissa, I have a few housekeeping duties to perform and I'll let you know that uh, the program for today's discussion. Please note that this event will be recorded and live streamed on FIP YouTube and will be available at the FIP website, www.fip.org. To all those listening live, please feel free to send your questions through the Q&A box provided and Paris and I will do our best to manage and get answers, manage those questions and get answers to all the questions you place in the Q&A box. You're most welcome to provide feedback on this webinar using webinars at fip.org. And if you're not currently a member of FIP, please take a moment after the webinar to join. The membership has many benefits, including invaluable resources, networking, timely events, and of course, webinars. I can tell you from my experience, an FIP membership has increased my knowledge, proven very useful in the performance of my duties. And of course, FIP is the global body representing over 4 million pharmacists and pharmaceutical scientists. If you're a pharmacist or pharmaceutical scientist and you would like to become a member, please join through the FIP website at 
www.fip.org. We'd like to take a moment, of course, to uh, recognize GSK. GSK has provided their support for today's webinar through unrestricted funds. For this event, we are joined by a panel, panel of fabulous and knowledgeable leaders in healthcare. I want to sincerely thank each one of them to take the time, taking the time to join us today on this webinar. And Prisar will do the introductions right after I describe the program and remind you of the learning object objectives. Well, the program is really straightforward. Uh, we'll introduce you to the panel and get right to the round table and panel discussion. We'll have time at the end of the uh, presentation for questions that you have placed in the Q&A box. And we will have some closing remarks before we finish and bid you farewell and best regards. Our learning objectives are listed on this slide and they are to identify drivers and barriers related to the regulatory landscape of vaccination in the region. We want to learn about examples of best practices in terms of interprofessional cooperation and task sharing involving pharmacists in the area of vaccination. And finally, explore the plans for switching from a pandemic to an endemic response in this region, including the role of pharmacists in vaccination and in patient care and treatment. Now, I will welcome my core moderator, Carissa. Over to you, please take over. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Ron. And good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Welcome to everyone who's zooming in um, to listen to our webinar. So my task is to introduce our panelists today. And we have got some excellent panelists from across the Western Pacific region for you. Amrahi Wang is the current president of Malaysian Pharmaceutical Society. He previously served 35 years at the University Malaya Medical Center in Kuala Lumpur as its chief pharmacist and deputy director professional. Mrahi is a member of the Malaysian Pharmacy Board, Malaysian Poisons Board, National Antimicrobial Resistance Committee, National Patient Safety Committee, and National Medicines Policy Steering Committee. Welcome, Mrahi. Our next panelist is John Jackson, who's the president of the Western Pacific Pharmaceutical Forum, which is involved throughout East and Southeast Asia and the Pacific in the enhancement of pharmacy practice. WPPF partnered with the European Union Asian Build Business Council, KPMG and Sanofi in workshops throughout the region, leading to the publication, The Role of Life Course Immunization in Healthy Aging in the Asian Region. John is also a member of Immunization for All Ages Roundtable, working to protect, progress, and expand immunization. Welcome, John. Our next speaker is our next panelist is Dr. Michael Moore AM, who's a member of the Order of Australia. He's the former CEO of the Public Health Association of Australia and is a past president of the World Federation of Public Health Associations and is currently chair of its Global Task Force on Immunization. Michael is a distinguished fellow at the George Institute for Global Health and is an adjunct professor at the University of Canberra in Australia and was formerly a teacher and consultant. Michael was Australia's first independent minister when he was appointed at Minister of Health and Community Care. Welcome, Michael. The next speaker, Professor Tony Nelson, is Chair of the Steering Committee of Immunization Partnership in Asia Pacific, which organizes the biennial Asian Vaccine Conference. He's a member of the Rota Council since 2012. He participated in WHO SAGE Working Group on Maternal and Neonatal Tetanus Elimination and Broader Tetanus Control. He's WHO's expert um, in group on quantitative immunization and vaccine related research. And he was a technical advisor for supporting independent immunization and vaccine advisory committees initiative. He's also a professor at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Welcome, Tony. 
Andy Shirtliff is a director of the Integrated Pharmacy Care Limited, a company which provides clinical advisory pharmacist services. Her background is in community pharmacy and providing medicine review and clinical advisory pharmacist services in both the residential care and community setting. Her current clinical work is in psychogeriatrics. Andy is actively involved in intern pharmacist assessment with the Pharmaceutical Society of New Zealand. She's an associate editor of the New Zealand National Formary and is an honorary lecturer at the Auckland University's School of Pharmacy. Welcome, Andy. And our final panelist member is Stephanie Tay, um, who obtained her doctorate in philosophy and bachelor's degree in science in pharmacy from the National University of Singapore. She has served in various roles in the Ministry of Health in Singapore and is currently in the Chief Pharmacist's Office. At the Chief Pharmacist's Office, Stephanie has gone back to her pharmacy roots and for the last five years has been working on pharmacy-related initiatives, including COVID-19 issues. Please join me in welcoming the panel members. We're now going to move on to our questions. Great. Okay, so our first question is a broad question to kick off this session. And I'm posing that question to all of our panel members. Um, and I think because our screens are very different, once I ask the question, I'll just say your name. So, that, and then if you can please respond. So the first question is, who are the main providers and locations of vaccine services in your country or region? John, may I start with you, please? Thank you, Arisa. It's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, it's a challenge to answer that question because I sit here as president of the Western Pacific pharmaceutical forum and in that role I don't take a single country perspective. I note that we have a number of attendees from outside the Western Pacific region which is wonderful and for their benefit I would just point out the region is very diverse in terms of healthcare delivery. Uh, we include countries such as China with massive populations and sizes and little island states like Nui, which has a very very small population and very isolated. So the question there Parisa of of, of who is responsible or how is vaccination provided, it depends upon the country. In some countries, it is very much a public health program, and that's particularly the case in the very small countries. In those countries that have got advanced and developed healthcare systems, we've got a combination of government-provided programs, particularly for childhood immunisation, and more private sector vaccination programs for people who may be wanting travel vaccination uh, or um, vaccinations through the life course. Immunisation vaccination, which is an important one for pharmacy, sits partly between government programs, particularly for the aged, and the private sector programs. So it's quite diverse. It's not an easy question to answer for our whole region, but hopefully that gives you a bit of a flavour of, of, uh, of how it spreads through the Western Pacific region. Thank you very much, John. May I pass on to Andy to give us a perspective from New Zealand? Uh, thank you. Um, in New Zealand, to pick up on some of the points that John raised, we have a mixture of privately funded vaccinations and publicly funded. Um, all of our childhood immunisations are publicly funded and historically have been um, the main provider has been general practice teams and historic, and we've had occupational health uh, teams uh, vaccinating workplaces and workers via a private market. We've had some school-based programmes Historically, the pharmacy role has been um, mostly a private market and mostly influenza vaccination. 
in the last few years that has shifted to an increasing amount of contribution to publicly funded influenza vaccines. And uh, COVID, our COVID vaccination program, um, I've been uh, uh, humbled and honoured to be the clinical pharmacy lead for our national va COVID vaccination rollout program in New Zealand. And uh, as of last week, uh, community pharmacy was our largest public, uh, all, all of our COVID vaccines are publicly funded and community pharmacy is our largest COVID vaccination provider. Um, so the landscape here is truly changing as a result of the pandemic that we are experiencing at the moment. And um, we have 45% um, of our community pharmacies providing half of the vaccines. So very high level summary. Um, historically general practice, mix of public and private, but it's changing. Michael, may I ask you to tell um, answer this question around the main providers and locations of vaccination services? Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Parisa, and it's good to be here. And let me acknowledge that I'm on Indigenous land and uh, I'm uh, on the land of the Ngunnawal people and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. Um, and I mention that specifically in this light because... Uh, the way our Indigenous people are vaccinated is often quite different from uh, others, but we have one of the highest vaccination rates in childhood vaccination amongst Indigenous people. It's one of the very few uh, health uh, good stories uh, for Indigenous people. But <clears throat> there's a big range within Australia uh, as to uh, uh, how we vaccinate. And with COVID, we were uh, very... Uh, um, it, it was very obvious that the government had set up specific uh, um, vaccination um, areas, uh, but at the same time, uh, G general practice uh, was uh, heavily involved, and they have been historically uh, the most important uh, pharmacies involved. And look, pharmacy here is basically, and it depends a bit on jurisdiction, but by and large, uh, pharmacies of recent years have been uh, uh, helping uh, to ensure uh, positive vaccination, particularly starting with flu. Uh, and, uh, and then it's been expanded beyond there. But, you know, local government as well as uh, um, state governments have been involved in vaccination uh, quite a, uh, quite a, uh, for quite some time. I think, though, fundamentally, it was really mostly in the hands of general practice. Uh, but we're watching that, we're watching that change. And I think that in this respect, COVID has probably been a springboard for change. And, uh, and I hope it uh, really does because we have been very good at childhood vaccination and not very good at uh, the rest of the life course with the exception of HPV, uh, which actually was uh, quite an outstanding. And an example, of course, where we actually vaccinated in schools. Uh, so, uh, uh, it is very variable as it is, I think, in, in many places. Remembering this is not my particular area of expertise, <laughs> but I'm trying to keep an overview on it. So if somebody else, uh, John, knows better about Australia, I've missed something, I'd be very happy for you to throw your uh, Tupney bits worth in. John, do you want to comment on that now or later? Like we can come back. Okay, great. I'll probably move on to Stephanie Kate to um, respond to that question as well from a Singaporean perspective, please. Yes. Um, so in Singapore, it's not unique. There's also a public sector and then a tie-ups with the private sector to allow for greater convenience and access to the vaccines. So for children and adults, there's actually a nationally recommended list for the children and the adults to actually take. And uh, depending on the, the age of the adult and as well as income level, there are varying amounts of subsidies. So um, but that, that's, uh, that will be sorted out at payment end. But for children, they can actually go to public sector institutions like the polyclinics or the hospitals. There will also be mobile vaccination teams that go to the schools as well. And there's also tie-ups with the private clinics so that the children, the parents can bring the children to these clinics for ease of vaccination. So for the adults, they likewise can go to the public sector. Uh, they can also go to the GP clinics, the general practitioner clinics, which are actually on the community health assist scheme, where they will also get the relevant subsidies. 
So all in all, because Singapore is quite a small island uh, with all these uh, resources actually being very accessible, this helps to uh, allow people to go for their vaccinations when they intend to. Great, thank you very much. Amrahi, can you give us a perspective from Malaysia? Uh, thank you, uh, Pereza. I think uh, the situation is, is not very different uh, in Malaysia. Uh, we have the uh, Malaysian National Immunization Program way back from the, uh, from the 50s and uh, involving uh, 13 uh, types of vaccines. And these are all given uh, free by the government. Right? And uh, as far as for the adult, uh, it's still something that, uh, that as, as, as we can see, uh, is, uh, the, is not funded by the government. So it's basically done by the uh, private healthcare facilities, by the GPs, and also uh, private hospitals, etc. And uh, also, uh, in terms of the uh, coverage, uh, especially for the kids, uh, it's actually across uh, the board, meaning that it covers uh, the whole of uh, of Malaysia, uh, be it uh, from the from the main town, the cities as well as for the uh, suburbs and also the rural areas. So I think uh, we, are, we are pretty okay uh, with, the, uh, with the kids' uh, vaccination, but not for the adults. So this is something that, that we can explore. And uh, with COVID coming in, uh, and uh, there are a lot of opportunities uh, for us to move further. And uh, this is something that uh, we look forward uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Tony, lastly, tell us about the main providers and locations of vaccination services in your region. So speaking with my hat for immunization partners for Asia Pacific, I guess my comments are similar to John. It's obviously very diverse um, and uh, very different health systems and different uh, mechanisms. Um, I think to me, one of the big issues for the diversity of different countries also relates to uh, who pays and how it gets reimbursed. So my understanding for Australia, um, although a lot of vaccines are publicly funded, they may be administered by, uh, as already been mentioned, by general practitioners or, or maybe now pharmacists, but they would um, claim back from the government. Um, so the sort of public-private interface is somewhat interwoven. Uh, Singapore, I think, is, uh, uh, as Stephanie's mentioned, has a quite a innovative and complex system where there's um, different levels of insurance and there's the polyclinics and the um, and the government services. But if you want to use your own sort of health insurance, whatever you can go private and and, and buy it. Um, I guess my experience from Hong Kong, which is my other hat, um, is somewhat similar to Singapore and maybe Malaysia to some extent and uh, Sri Lanka um, and maybe even New Zealand slightly where the uh, public and private is um, quite uh, separated. So if it's a government funded program, uh, you have to go to the government centers to get the government vaccines. Uh, if you want to go private, um, then you pay out of pocket or you pay with your own health insurance um, and you don't, and you can't claim back anything from government. So. So it's sort of totally ring fenced. And, um, and I think that different funding mechanism very much influences um, who wants to give vaccines. So if the pharmacists can't get reimbursed, then um, you know, maybe they are less enthusiastic to give it in the private sector. Whereas, um, uh, so, so yes, yeah, so I think the, the countries in, um, that have a totally government funded system, you know, free of charge to the recipient, um, we do see a, a difference in terms of who gets vaccines. The final point I just make is um, I think HPV vaccine was brought up in Australia, but all, um, and being a school based and being very successful, uh, I think Malaysia has also had a fantastically successful school based program. So, so I guess whether it's the pharmacist or the nurse or the doctor who gives it at school to me doesn't matter. But I think the bigger question there is um, recognizing that some vaccine programs location is more important then who actually gives it? So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much, John.
Sorry about that. It had to happen. Um, just listening to everybody, there were two other areas where vaccination has become quite common that I thought were worth mentioning at this stage. And one is the workplace. And we saw it start with workplace immunisation for influenza, which became a, almost an employment benefit for people, but also obviously delivers uh, benefits to the employers of having a healthier workforce. And of course, that's become um, uh, notable also with uh, COVID vaccination, which sometimes has been administered in the workplace. The other location of vaccination is, of course, in residential aged care facilities. And uh, again, uh, COVID has uh, heightened the need for that age group and created the opportunity to deliver in that location. So there are just two other areas that I thought worth putting on the table at this stage. Thank you very much, John. Um, and I agree, school definitely provides a good captive location for vaccination and soon the work environment will probably be like that as well for adults in that captive environment to get people vaccinated. I think some of the um, comments from Tony in terms of highlighting the funding lends itself to my next question, which is really focusing around regulatory frameworks um, or other enabling strategies, but which have really been helpful and supportive um, in pharmacists getting involved in vaccination. So may I pose that question to Andy um, and John and also Tony around, and then Stephanie, so four people in this case, what are the specific regulatory frameworks or enabling strategies that have supported the role of pharmacists in vaccination in your countries? Andy. Thank you, Parissa. Um, I've highlighted a few things that I think are, yeah, there are many things, but I've tried to focus on some of the things that I think may be unique to New Zealand. Um, I may be wrong in that, but um, the things that I thought I'd share is that we have um, a classification system in New Zealand for our medicines, and one of those classifications is a pharmacist only uh, um, classification, which means that it medicine if it's shifted into this category can only be provided by a pharmacist and, and a pharmacy or an intern pharmacist. So we've used our reclassification process to free up access to some of our vaccines. Largely that's enabled a private market but it's enabled us to shift the market and shift the practice and, and open up access to vaccines to a, a wider group of the population. Um, we've worked with our uh, officials across our um, national vaccination programs to get official recognition of our pharmacist vaccinator training that occurs through um, just through our general training. And we've also um, worked with our official with our regulator, our pharmacy regulator and our vaccinator um, vaccination program to get official recognition of the pharmacy cold chain that is automatically part of the pharmacy licensing auditing. So rather than requiring our, our colleagues to undertake a, um, a, you know, a dual process, but to get um, official regulatory re um, recognition of that cold chain. We've also, um, through COVID, created two um, two new roles we have enabled through um, our regulatory framework a provisional vaccinator role so we created that under urgency during 2020 that supported a truncated learning around um, flu influenza and MMR vaccine and then we added on COVID for um, regulated health professionals and that enabled pharmacists who hadn't done the full vaccinator training to be able to um, up, to upskill and contribute to our vaccinator workforce. And the other thing that we've done um, last year was we used our, um, we put through a new medicines regulator to, regulation to support a COVID-19 vaccinator role which enables non-health professional 
members of the public to be able to train up to provide our COVID vaccine under supervision. So that um, enables all of our vaccinators and that includes our pharmacists to be able to run pharmacist bed clinics. And rather than being the person that's giving all of the vaccinations, they can lead a team and be that clinical lead and that clinical supervisor for, for the service. So there are a few of the regulatory framework enabling structures that we've been working on over the last um, probably um, five to ten years. That's very comprehensive. John, can you comment perhaps around Australia and also, uh, if possible, around some of the areas in the region? Yeah, thank you, Parisa. Um, enabling strategies for pharmacy-based vaccination. I argue that we really need to start with being able to manage the supply of vaccination well. I mean, that's our core role. Uh, before we get involved in administration, we have to be, where possible, reliable, competent suppliers of vaccine. And I think the next step is to actually be advocates, strong advocates of the benefit of vaccination. It's only when we actually establish that credential that we have a basis for then arguing for pharmacy as a basis for vaccination. And the next enabling strategy, I believe, is to bring recognised vaccinators into pharmacy. So people who the health system recognise are competent vaccinators, nurses, for example, and have them vaccinate in pharmacy so that the health system becomes familiar with the idea that pharmacy is a place for vaccination. And then we can build on the concept of pharmacist vaccinators vaccinating in pharmacy or elsewhere in the health system. And to enable that to happen, what I notice works well is for the profession, for pharmacy to choose one jurisdiction and one vaccine for adults and gain approval to do that and prove bona fides, prove competence in that experiment, rather than trying to do it in the whole country right, right from the outset. So having proven in one jurisdiction with one vaccine, and in most countries it's influenza, with adults, you can then, on the basis of that proof of competence, gain approval in the next state or the next jurisdiction. And you can gain to uh, rights to vaccinate with other vaccines and vaccinate a wider range group into children. But to be able to prove this competence, there are a couple of things we actually have to put in place to enable this to occur. We actually have to have, and Andy's already described these, so I'll just gloss over them, but credential training for vaccinators, pharmacist vaccinators, that matches the training that nurses would go through for vaccination. It's very strange that the medical profession don't necessarily need to prove their competence in this area. It's often just a given. But for pharmacists, we will need to prove our competence, and that should be to the same standard as nurses or other vaccinators. We actually have to have approved facilities. And I see vaccination as a... A, a also a, almost a, an enabler for us to build a whole suite of professional programs because to vaccinate we will have to have privacy we will have so we will have to have integrated records and there's a wide range of other things that i'm sure we'll pick up later in the discussion but i'll leave it at that at this stage thanks for right. thank you very much john Stephanie, could you give us the perspective from Singapore? What have been the regulatory frameworks on enabling strategies to support pharmacists in vaccination? Um, well, unfortunately, at the moment, pharmacists are not uh, legally allowed to uh, administer vaccinations. But then um, I can share two instances where actually this, there have been things in the works to actually promote uh, the pharmacist's role in vaccination. So the first one would be the collaborative prescribing, where pharmacists are actually uh, allowed to prescribe, uh, but this is in accordance with a collaborative practice agreement, which has the support of the medical physicians in their institution. So I think one of the questions was asking about the acceptance of such prescribing uh, uh, by pharmacists. And I, I must say that in the, especially in the hospitals where the doctors are really uh, overworked and they are quite glad to have the pharmacists help out and actually doing this prescribing of vaccines in their state. So that is one. 
Uh, second one also similar to what Andy has described uh, during COVID, um, when the, all the vaccination centers for COVID vaccinations were sprouting up across the island, there was actually a call for healthcare professionals to step forward to actually help out. And so this included pharmacists and the roles accorded to them actually also included vaccination. Uh, there, there were not many, but this was a one step. Uh, and actually there were regulatory exemptions made to allow for these pharmacists to perform the vaccination. So these are just uh, two instances where we're hoping to move towards that direction in Singapore. Great, thank you. And if I um, am Rahi, would you like to answer that question as well? I think uh, I, I I really agree uh, with the, the input from Andy uh, Johnson and uh, John and uh, Stephanie. And I think I just want to share a thing that happening in terms of the whole uh, vaccination program. I think we have to be uh, you know sure that you know that the pharmacist plays a very big role in the vaccination program, in national immunization program. I think uh, we, have to, we, have to, we have to look into where, you know, when the regulatory com comes in, you know, because in Malaysia, I think in all other states also, the involvement of pharmacists are very real and, and something that, that you know, we, we, could, we, we look into the importance of, you know, uh, making, a, say, registration process, for example. You know, you cannot have uh, the vaccine inside any country especially in Malaysia, without being registered. And our colleagues uh, as, uh, as regulators are doing a very fine job, you know, to make sure that they are of quality, uh, safe and uh, efficacy, you know. Uh, that's, that's one big role that, that, that the pharmacist has played in any uh, national immunization program. Advocacy, like what John says, really huge, you know, because uh, even, even uh, from the point of myself, uh, PPMPS, yeah, we did a lot of advocacy program right when we start, uh, when even uh, even before the vaccine, uh, you know, came in, you know, we have to prepare uh, the, the people that vaccination is imminent and we have to actually do it, you know, and then uh, and then when uh, when the thing happens, we talk about logistics, you know, and the and the road and the pharmacists, you know, logistics, they really uh, it's really really huge, you know, uh, huge. And I think Stephanie also mentioned about the, you know, uh, the one in the uh, vaccine center. So in fact, uh, pharmacists uh, in Malaysia are also involved in the screening and so on and so forth. And uh, just, I just want to share one uh, uh, good news. We wrote to the, uh, to the government uh, way back in uh, January 2021, you know, to say that you know that uh, probably we can help you know in terms of the COVID, and uh, finally we got an answer from them after thirteen months. So now uh, I'm glad to uh, to announce that under the uh, what you call under under the initiative what we call as the public uh, private partnership, the Ministry of Health agreed uh, to their company. Uh, we call it the Pro uh, Protect Health Corp operation and allow train the uh, pharmacy vaccinators to actually give uh, COVID uh, vaccine in the vaccine center. So that is the latest I want to share with all of you. Thank you. That is great news. That's very good news. And Tony, I promised to get you to answer this question as well. And you gave us a broad overview of the funding models. Is there a broad overview of the regulatory frameworks in the region? Well, maybe I'll be a little bit more philosophical. Um, I mean, why do we have regulation, I guess? Um, and I guess we would like to believe it's to keep uh, patients safe and to um, make sure that competent people are giving the vaccines and maybe to protect patients who have an adverse event and need resuscitation or uh, these may be some of the reasons behind it. Um, but I think COVID's obviously been very interesting in that um, I think Andy sort of indicated that suddenly regulations can be changed because we suddenly realised that these wonderful regulations we had actually didn't really need to be there in the first place because we can actually do something differently in a different way. So, so I guess that begs the question, uh, you know, sometimes uh, regulations are there to protect sort of certain professional groups or others uh, from encroachment uh, of their patch. 
And I guess this particularly implies maybe in the private sector uh, where, um, so, so sort of with my sort of Hong Kong hat, I mean, my understanding to some extent, uh, only doctors are actually able to give vaccines, but the nurse can do it under sort of doctor supervision. So, you know, so the sense of, um, you know, a patient collapses from an anaphylaxis that there's someone there to sort of resuscitate or whatever. But, um, but I, I've had some difficulty getting that uh, legislation. So I'm, I'm not sure whether that's 100% correct. But um, I think the point I'm making is that, uh, you know, regulations can sometimes appear to be overly stringent, um, maybe for not good reasons. So, so I think we have to maybe look at that a little bit in terms of, uh, you know, why are they there? Um, you know, is it really to protect safety and, um, and adverse events, or is it maybe for some other reason? Great, thank you very much, Tony. So in the interest of time, I'm gonna pass on to Ron, because we've got quite a number of other questions still to ask. So over to you, Ron. Thank you so much. Uh, great discussion. I'm trying to take some notes and uh, watch what's going on in the chat and uh, uh, the question and answers. And I haven't got enough fingers or enough mental capacity to follow it all, but it's a great discussion. So I'd like to take us over to the idea of uh, where you can describe some best practices, uh, maybe in your country or in your region in terms of the interprofessional cooperation and task sharing involving pharmacists in the area of vaccination. We've had some comments already uh, about that, but maybe a little uh, a deeper dive and, and maybe perhaps some examples about that collaboration. Some uh, great news from Malaysia and uh, what's gonna be happening there very soon. Uh, but uh, I'll turn it over to John, if you can start us off on that uh, with respect to best practices uh, please. Best practices in interprofessional collaboration. Look, I think uh, if I consider and picking up something Tony said, uh, the, the comments made by the medical profession about pharmacist vaccination, uh, we need to be able to address those and that will create the best practice. So the comments are things like uh, competence, uh, having appropriate facility, but a very important one, and I totally endorse their comments, is that if pharmacists are going to administer vaccines, we have to be able to get the record of the administration into the patient record that the GP holds, the medical practitioner holds. So best practice is for our profession to integrate practitioners who rightly are the uh, person able to uh, best manage the patient's comprehensive care. So we've all got a, a, a role to play, but we shouldn't be trying to do this aside from not connected with the patient's GP. So best practice for me is ensuring that we can address all of those concerns that the medical profession have expressed by having competence, by having appropriate facilities and providing integrated care. Um, look, we actually have to be able to provide vaccination appropriate for the patient, depending upon their medical condition and their life course and so this is something that needs to be done in a collaborative manner with their general practitioner. Uh, Ron, I hope those comments help. Uh, they sure do great points too. And uh, I think the, uh, the challenge is, as you've described, is having some of this silo information, information contained at the pharmacy, information contained in the medical records, information contained in maybe a government source records. And collaboration is not only about the speaking between uh, the professionals, but also that collaboration of the data on the patient. And of course, absolutely, the, the patient needs to be involved in that as well. Great point. Uh, Michael, could you join in on this conversation and give us your perspective? And I think also picking up on uh, the way Tony finished that, of course, training is uh, a really important part that uh, the pharmacists are seen to have the same level 
of training as your nurses, as your uh, uh, medical practitioners and so on. But for me, one of the interesting things about collaboration is also how you influence, and that is my area of specialty, how you influence a government to make these regulatory changes. And uh, of course, there's nothing stronger than a wide group of uh, non-government organisations, uh, unions, etc., that are pushing in the same direction. So uh, certainly the Pharmacy Guild in Australia worked very closely with me when I was the CEO of the Public Health Association of Australia. Um, the the uh, International Pharmacy Organisation I work with in the World Federation of Public Health Associations. But really important to sort of expand that. So one of the things that occurs to me is the cancer councils uh, in Australia, because we know the role that uh, vaccines are nothing more obvious than HPV, play with regard to uh, those areas. But there's also NGOs uh, around a whole run of uh, specific uh, diseases that uh, could uh, also be brought in uh, as part of this uh, influencing change when we see regulation that is no longer necessary. Because, you know, one of the, well, I think one of the main points for regulation around vaccines was probably about training in the initial instance, um, but a reasonably easy hurdle to, uh, to overcome. So uh, to me, working very closely with other organisations uh, and certainly the medical profession, the College of um, General Practice, the, uh, um, the AMA and so the medical associations and so forth uh, become very, very important uh, as well. But we can't lose sight of what is the goal. And, you know, and what we're going to try and seek and what we would support in the public health uh, community is how do we get better health outcomes? I mean, that's the crunch. And, uh, and getting more, uh, more widely vaccinated community, particularly uh, ageing community, is uh, incredibly important. And don't forget that pharmacists are one of the most trusted groups in society. So uh, this is a really big plus with politicians as an ex-politician. These are, these are really is a very, very big plus when you are trying to uh, influence government. I hope that's, I hope that's a, I mean, a little bit off to one side, but I hope that's helpful. <laughs> no, very, very helpful. And uh, it's part of a, a great discussion and uh, trusted and certainly accessible. I, I think in pretty much every country, uh, pharmacists are one of the most accessible healthcare professionals and sometimes to our own demise because uh, everyone's then challenging us to uh, do more and provide more. And I think there's been some comments about uh, regulations and you're talking to a former regulator, but it's, I think the key around that is to develop enabling leg legislation, enabling regulations. And you wanna make sure that public protection is there and you can do that, but it's also isn't prohibitive. So before I go on and, and get uh, talking too much, just wanna give uh, Tony a chance to jump in on the idea of best practices. And, and we wanna keep in mind that uh, COVID has been an example about how best practices have jumped to the forefront, but how do we keep that energy? How do we keep those best practices maintained as we look into the greater vision of all vaccinations? Tony, uh, any thoughts on that or, or any additional thoughts about best practices? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, picking up on the point about record keeping, um, and I guess COVID has introduced the idea of vaccine passports and, um, and good documentation of your, of your vaccination status. Um, and again, the interface between the public and the private sector may vary very much from country to country. Um, so when you used to have a paper-based record for your vaccine, um, you could take that between the public sector and the private sector and that happens to, in Hong Kong to some extent, but increasingly, obviously, vaccines are going into databases and onto QR codes. And um, so it really depends on each country in terms of whether they have the uh, IT infrastructure to seamlessly put that vaccine into the system. And obviously, you've got to reassure, I guess, the population in terms of their privacy and uh, and other things about such systems. So 
so I think it's, an, it's a very complex area, but I think, you know, for fully integrated um, interplay between public and private sectors, pharmacists, you know, nurses, doctors, you know, different people giving vaccines, um, the patient probably wants a reliable record and that has to be somehow unified. Thank you very much, Tony. And uh, I'm going to, uh, full disclosure, not be as, be not be as good with uh, technology as Parissa was. And if there are some uh, of the panel that want to join in on this, just open your mic and please uh, join in. And if everyone joins it at once, we'll be respectful and allow someone to go first. But if not, we can certainly move on to the next question that I will want to hear from the panelists. Well, I think we have Amrahi with a raised hand. Yeah. Yes, please go ahead and please. Yeah, thank you. I think I, I would like to share a few uh, incidences where actually COVID have changed the whole uh, picture uh, regarding the role of pharmacists. Yeah? I think uh, we've, uh, col we've close collaboration with, uh, with doctors and so on. Uh, when we talk about uh, the provision of telemedicine and also the provision of telepharmacy, eh, the use of digitalization and uh, if you notice at the moment now, uh, when we are actually uh, facing the Omicron wave, yeah, sort of actually uh, doing home, uh, what you call um, quarantine, even though they are positive, right? And that's where the role of pharmacists are very important with the concept of self-care. How do actually we educate? You know, they, we educate the, uh, you know, the population or in the community where they are now going uh, on uh, quarantine, but to manage, you know, uh, during their country. So these are all very important, you know, uh, things that the pharmacists can do. And the whole idea is actually to building trust of the pharmacists uh, within the community. So when that trust has been built, so I think the move towards when we do the vaccination, you know, it was something that, 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 that can be done easily. So this is, this is, this is very relevant when you talk about the, the booster dose at the moment, you know, where we actually have to do further advocacy uh, in terms of booster dose and so on. So these are areas where I want to share, you know, to make sure that, you know, that the role of pharmacists is still really relevant uh, in vaccination. Thank you. Thank you, Amory. And I, now I see a hand waving and it is uh, that of Andy. So Andy, please join in. Thank you. I was um, excited to see this question on the list. Um, I focused in particularly on the interprofessional um, aspect of the question. We, we've had examples across New Zealand and I think this is the first time where we've had um, doctors and nurses working in pharmacy-led clinics and, and every other combination of that than you can that you can make up in that combination. And it's been Really exciting to see the professions working together for the good of the, the community. But a couple of specific things I was, I've been really quite um, keen to share. Um, in New Zealand, we've had examples of um, where our pharmacists have really focused on um, operating mobile services out from a, a, their fixed premises and going out into communities working in our local uh, marae, which would be our local Māori community, a community hub, working with uh, um, Tangata Whenua Indigenous people, We're working in Sikh communities alongside welfare services and food package services and providing vaccinations in and, and, and the, the, those people's communities. Um, uh, going in to gang communities and providing vaccinations with, with gang members and their families in, in their trusted environment. And it's been, we've had a really real push on no door being the wrong door. So rather than focusing on traditional sites and traditional um, roles, but instead providing vaccinations for people from someone they trust and a place that they trust. So focusing on the outcomes and what me, what's important to the population. And it's been really exciting to see the shift and we're working quite hard at the system level to make certain that our system retains those fabulous advantages, advances, sorry, but they are advantages as well. Great comments, thank you very much. And I just maybe want to, uh, uh, yeah, 
spring in uh, on, on Stephanie and, and bring her in if there are some best practices you can uh, advise us of. But also, um, is uh, maybe speak about your experience uh, where there's been some known opposition in your area about pharmacists doing vaccination, or as someone said earlier, having actually the vaccinations in the pharmacy, not necessarily being performed by the pharmacy staff. It could be a nurse. Do you, do you, would you wish to report on that at all, Stephanie? Um, so at the moment, these are not uh, happening in Singapore because the regulation does not allow for pharmacists administrating vaccinations. But I think one of the key concerns as well, I, I think there was talk about trusting the pharmacists. I think the issue is not so much trusting the pharmacists, but trusting the vaccine. And I, I trust that vaccine hesitancy is a very, very big issue in many countries. So regardless of how much trust someone has in their healthcare professional, I think first and foremost, the hurdle to overcome is whether they are willing to take the vaccine. Uh, whoever is that you jabbing in the arm. And I noticed also, uh, this was in the q and I think some people have raised it as well. And I think um, even in Singapore, the, the rate of vaccination, for example, for influenza, for the rec recommended population of seniors is quite low. It's like a low 24%. And I think even um, um, the seniors do generally trust their healthcare professionals, but I think the issue is, do they trust the vaccine? <laughs> and I'm not quite sure how, how this can be addressed. Maybe others from, can, can perhaps share how they can overcome this. <laughs> uh, great points. And uh, I'll just pause for a moment. If someone wants to speak about the vaccine trust, it does take us on to a little bit of a different area, but I think an important area nonetheless. Ron, while people are thinking about that, there's just two little points uh, I'd uh, like to make. And the first is the importance of national immunisation registers, um, because uh, that, uh, and I think that's self-evident uh, what I mean uh, by that, and not just childhood immunisation registers. Um, the second uh, element I wanted to, when um, Andy was talking about cross-professional things, we have a fantastic model in Australia with Aboriginal medical services. They are already, uh, and I think it's the same with uh, some of the Maori ones in New Zealand, but uh, they already work right across the medical professions and do it in a really positive way. Uh, and I think there's a lesson to be uh, learnt there as well. Thank you very much, Michael. And I see John with his hand raised. Please go ahead, John. Uh, yeah, thanks, Ron. I'm picking up on that important point that Stephanie made about trust in vaccination. And uh, I just wanted to highlight that a lot of work I was doing uh, in the ASEAN region, um, really just at the beginning of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, the major issue was awareness of vaccines rather than trust. Um, yes, people knew of childhood vaccination, but they really did not know of vaccinations that would have been appropriate for them through their life course. And I put this down to the fact that most of our countries in our region have uh, vaccination schedules that are really just for the young age groups. And I think an important task, and this is something that our profession can pick up, but it's something to be done, obviously, with the medical profession and with the governments, is to ensure we actually have vaccination schedules for the life course. And then, of course, we then need to think about how our experience with COVID vaccination is going to influence people's awareness and acceptance of vaccination. And yes, they will be more aware, but unfortunately, I think the jury is out as to their level of acceptance. So, um, Stephanie, totally correct. Uh, we need to ensure there is trust in vaccinations, but we need them to know about vaccines. We know it. It's our bread and butter. But a lot of the public do not, particularly those in countries with developing health systems and people who are remote from the urban centres. That's where we have a major issue. Yeah, a great point. And uh, one of the things we did uh, want to cover is not so much, while well, it's important, obviously, but the farms has been the source of or the pharmacy being the source of the poke in the arm, but also the source of that information. Um, I don't want to get too grandiose, but that source of truth where 
we're being a trusted profession, we can also be trusted for telling them the uh, information that they need to know about the vaccinations and uh, allay those concerns. But I'm not supposed to be talking, so I'll turn it over to Amory. I see you have your hand up as well, please. Yeah, I just want to respond to the, the issue raised by Stephanie just now in terms of vaccine hesitancy. You see, in the Muslim population, yeah, uh, halal is actually an issue, all right? And uh, actually, the government of Indonesia and also uh, Malaysia and Brunei, you know, uh, we actually take it as a very, uh, take this very seriously. Lah. So, meaning that, you know, uh, with the input from the pharmacists, uh, we are able to actually give the input, you know, to, to the government saying that, you know, that this is something that, uh, that is not an issue. And, uh, and the Muslim population actually can take it. So this is uh, the point that, 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 that we have done actually in Indonesia, uh, Malaysia and even Brunei to make sure that, you know, that, that this aspect has been tackled. Thank you. Uh, great comments. Thank you. Um, I want to move us a little bit into the discussion of uh, pandemic moving into endemic. And, uh, you know, not to be too presumptuous to say we're at that point, um, but in all good planning, um, we need to have that uh, discussion and raise that level of awareness among the community, the patients, but also how do the systems uh, uh, evolve or shift uh, to address the endemic when we have sort of known uh, virus, known impact, no uh, likely uh, patients being affected, patients' populations, as opposed to not knowing it's going to happen the next day, we have a better understanding of what's happening when we get to that endemic process. Now, I'm wondering, um, I see John uh, might be interested in leading that conversation. Uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you want to lead us on with that, and then I'll watch for the hands as they come along. Thanks, Ron. Yes, I think we are at a very interesting stage. Look, it's, there's no doubt that the pandemic has stimulated pharmacy and its role in vaccination. Uh, I can cite the Philippines where we now have had training programs for pharmacists to administer vaccines, but not so much in the pharmacies, but they've been engaged in programs uh, that have been run in basically public health programs. Um, we've seen a heightened awareness of vaccination uh, through the, as a result of the pandemic. The issue that I am personally concerned with is a lot of this um, capacity for pharmacists to be involved with vaccination that has arisen from the pandemic was enabled through emergency regulation. Naturally, governments have had to take emergency uh, regulation steps to enable things to happen quickly. But these emergency regulations have a finite life. And unless we are um, diligent and ensure that those emergency capacities that we have for the administration of COVID vaccine are translated into permanent regulatory change, we may well lose some of the advantage we have. So that's a task for us at the moment. And one of the things I do note is that uh, to obviously bring the profession into vaccination in a number of countries, the funding agencies, be they government programs, be they insurers, have funded pharmacists to administer COVID vaccines. But again, this has been through an emergency arrangement. And as a profession, altruistic as we are, keen to be involved and build our practice, we can only administer vaccines if it is a viable part of our practice. So we do need to ensure that what has been established through COVID as support for pharmacy administration of a vaccine, whether it be pharmacists administering in pharmacies or pharmacists administering in public health programs outside of pharmacies, we need to pedal very fast and hard to make sure that emergency arrangement becomes permanent. Uh, great point. Uh, I think we uh, certainly all can reflect upon that in our jurisdictions because of the changes that were done and with some immediacy and, and rightfully so. But now we need those changes to be, have some permanency as well. 
Um, we are getting a little bit short on time. I just wanted to uh, do one more scan on uh, hands up around the concept of uh, how we uh, switch from pandemic to endemic, and then we will turn it back over to Parissa. Uh, Andy, please. Um, just two brief comments. John's made me realize that there is a very small silver lining to having quite old emergency legislation. It's required us to actually push through with pace uh, permanent changes. <laughs> um, so uh, I haven't thought about that until now. So I, I, I thank John for that, um, that uh, light shining for me. Um, I think one thing that, um, that I would comment on is that, uh, for example, in New Zealand, we don't have all of our general practices providing COVID vaccines. We don't have all of our pharmacies providing COVID vaccines. And there's an element to the endemic aspect where we need to normalise this process of um, vaccination and, and um, vaccination being just an accepted part of good self-care and having a range of providers and you can choose the one that suits you. So I think, um, I certainly think in New Zealand we have still have a wee way to go in um, normalising that whole process and that's part of living with, with a new infectious disease. Thanks Andy, great comments and uh... Without keep or to keep my promise, I'll pass it on to Parissa, and she has uh, some additional uh, challenges and information for the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. I also noticed Tony just had his hand up. Tony, did you want to make a comment on that last question? I think obviously a lot difference happened during COVID and um, there should be a lot of uh, different practices that weren't there before. Um, I think we should always come back to, to me, one of the most important things is what is the most cost effective way to get the most vaccines to the most people. And if that's true, some pharmacy led program, then hopefully there's some data that can be put together to show that's the case. Um, or if it's some other team that goes into schools or workplaces and can achieve that end, whether it's led by pharmacists or nurses or people just trained purely to give vaccines, then uh, that would be good to know about. So I would like to maybe make a call that we should be uh, getting better data in terms of what are the most cost-effective way to give the most vaccines to most people. Um, so I have really one more question left to, to ask the panel. Um, and then after that, I'll be handing over to Ron to ask um, the questions that are coming from the audience. So to the audience, you've got time now to write some questions in the Q&A box, if you can, please. So my last question is really around what can FIP do? And currently what FIP is already doing is providing resources to support change at country levels, such as advocacy tools, providing global data where available, guidelines and practice support tools. On top of that, FIP organizes such events and webinars as we're part of to increase that um, knowledge transmission. FIP also has a number of key partnerships to advocate a broader role for pharmacy and vaccination, especially with organizations such as the WHO, where they can advocate for the role of our profession in facilitating vaccination services and improving vaccine uptake across the life's um, course. Now, there's also the Transforming Vaccination Program, which has been obviously quite key in the last two years. Um, in supporting FIP members in accelerating programs of equity, access and sustainability of vaccinations through policy development and implementation. And all of our work um, is in a website that I believe Gonzo has put up on the um, chat. So it's the prevention.fip.org slash vaccination, if you can have a look at that. So bearing this in mind, I open it to the panel 
what more can we do as the largest international organization of pharmacists to support pharmacists as well as the healthcare professional team in increasing the uptake of vaccination along the life course and involving pharmacists as a key healthcare professional. Who cares to touch on this subject first? Michael. Why don't you let the outsider come in first? Uh, <laughs> Go for so, it. Yeah. <laughs> And look, I already worked with Gonzalo uh, at the uh, international level with World Health Organization. And one of the important lessons is not just to look after pharmacy, but also understand what your partners are looking for as well. Uh, so that it's uh, because pharmacists have such significant influence. It sort of touches on a question uh, earlier as, uh, as well, but you'll probably come back to it, uh, about um, how, can, how can we have more, more influence and I think that working with more and more partners is really important, but to do so in an each way, uh, you know, in, a, in as any good relationship, it's a two way, it's a two way uh, street. And what is it that the World Federation of Public Health Associations are working on, uh, for example, climate and health? Uh, and and so this is already happening uh, with the uh, um, with FIP uh, in some ways, but um, then you expand out to the World Heart Federation uh, and uh, and so on. So I think that's a really, really important uh, part of what's happening. We really do want to support uh, pharmacists because we can see, uh, as I think it was John raised before, both cost effectiveness, maybe it was Tony, cost effectiveness uh, and delivering to more and more people, but getting better health outcomes, therefore, uh, right across the life course to as many people as we possibly can with a particular focus on low and middle income countries. Thank you. John. Thanks, Marisa. Um, what can FIP do to help? I'm going to discuss two areas. Uh, one is that um, we can learn from each other, but we need the right other to learn from. Uh, what FIP does uh, on a global scale is um, bring a lot of ideas together. And sometimes it's, it's daunting. I, mean, I have no doubt that it is daunting for pharmacists in some countries. What FIP could do to help is to match countries that have common language, levels of development of health system, and cultural aspects, because culture is very important in the way the public respond to pharmacists changing their practice. In some cultures, it is not expected for a pharmacist to touch you and to particularly to inject you. And so you've got to bring together countries that have those similar cultures within their public that have similar health systems, similar languages. So that's one thing they could do. But I've got a suggestion for another approach. I do not see vaccination as an end in itself. I see the introduction of vaccination in pharmacy and pharmacist involvement with vaccination as one example of the profession advancing its practice, broadening its scope of practice. If we build our practices to the extent where we can introduce vaccination successfully, we will have built them to the extent where we can do a lot of other services. So what I'd suggest to FIP is to do just that. And they do this, of course, obviously. Help to establish within pharmacy practice the workforce cap capability, the uh, attitudes and, and uh, beliefs, uh, the workforce capacity, an understanding of health funding and the economics of health funding, and what is expected under good pharmacy practice of an, an, an appropriate pharmacy service. Because if we can build that in, in, in a country or in all countries, then not only will we be able to introduce vaccination, but we'll be well positioned to introduce other services uh, in addition. Thanks. Thank you very much, John. Um, any other comments from the panel about what FIP can do or what further can FIP do? Okay. 
Um, I'm right. I'll just I'll just uh, jump in from uh, following up on John. Seeing so there's a quiet moment, and that's just opportunity for me to open my mouth. I'm sorry, um, but I think I think John's got a, a great point, and also um, uh, uh, as we heard from uh, in uh, in Malaysia, like there's different levels of of, 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 of how they're on moving along the continuum and not only match that culture and uh, uh, language, uh, but also match where they are in the continuum. FIP's got a phenomenal amount of information, as I said in the opening, on their website. Great tools, um, but, you know, it's, it's built. Uh, but how do we get those tools to the people that need them the most? And how do we then support them, not necessarily FIP, but how do other countries perhaps support them in moving uh, the pharmacist's practice along the continuum to meet the vaccination needs of the general population? And again, I think it was, uh, I'm gonna uh, pause for a moment. It might've been uh, uh, Michael that was talking about the uh, Aboriginal community and how we try to meet their needs because their needs are very, very much different. I mean, their needs are different, but the way they, we need to reach out to them is very, very much different. And certainly some are, are in remote and underserviced areas. And we don't want to lose sight that uh, meeting the needs of, the, of those populations and, uh, and similar populations is very, very important as well. So sorry, I had to just get that out. Um, no, thank you. I also noticed that Amrahi had his hand up as well. Um, maybe you wanted okay. to add something about what FIP can do. Thank you. Yeah. I think I agree with what uh, everyone has said in, uh, from John and, and the rest. But I think it's very important from the point of, of ourselves, uh, MPS, uh, in Malaysia, we believe that, you know, that we cannot compromise on quality. We believe that, you know, when we talk about us giving professional services, you know, we have to be competent. So that's why when we get ourselves prepared, uh, much, much earlier when actually we sent that letter to the, to the government is to make sure that when they make a decision, we are able to respond. So that's why uh, if we look into, uh, into this, uh, MPS actually has actually uh, come up with a micro credentialing uh, certificate with University uh, Science Malaysia. I think this is very important because of the fact that when you, when, when you deal uh, with uh, fellow healthcare professionals, you know, and the government, we must make sure that we really uh, put in the, the workforce or people going to do uh, that they're really trained and you know, no one. So we are, we are not going to do it, uh, you know, in a fast way and, and so on and so forth. We are even not talking about doing only for COVID, you know. We are talking about preparing uh, things. So if we can work with the School of Pharmacy, you know, to put this uh, into the curriculum, and then develop from there the interest and so on, because we need to prepare uh, for the future. So that's the reason why, you know, we go into, into this route in this aspect of vaccination. Thank you. Great, thank you. Andy. Thank you. Just a brief comment. I think there are a couple of areas where I think FIP um, already shows leadership, but are really important. So, um, if, if more is possible, then, then yes, please. Um, one of them is around the um, uh, 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 supporting better understanding amongst other health professions and amongst populations of the skills and competencies of pharmacists um, and our pharmacy technician staff. Um, I have, I'm, I'm regularly surprised at how often I have to talk to the tertiary, my, the qualifications of my highly qualified tertiary colleagues. Um, and also that, um, that importance of working with other health professionals and task sharing and and um, bringing those complementary skill sets together so that members of the public, they, they, they have choice um, even within one provider. Um, then for example, our, our nursing colleagues, their, their skill sets and competencies are a fantastic complement to the pharmacist skill sets. And um, just um, 
as much leadership as possible and advocacy in that space, I think, is, is really valuable. So I'm now going to pass on to Ron um, to ask uh, a question and perhaps a question from the audience. Thank you, Ron. Uh, very good. Thank you so much. Uh, just one uh, plug I'll put in uh, out of the regulators forum. Uh, probably about a year ago now, we developed a self-assessment tool where countries can and uh, policymakers, ministries uh, within that country can use this tool to assess uh, their level of preparedness or readiness or ability to uh, expand the practice of pharmacists around a pandemic, that being vaccination, perhaps testing, uh, administrations of vaccines, information. So it's really a, a valuable tool. And I'll uh, put a, a, a note to my good colleague, uh, Gonzalo, if you can put that into the chat line and, and maybe provide that link to those that are interested. One of the questions that I saw in the Q&A is one about uh, vaccine hesitancy and uh, kind of the difficult issue when we have um, uh, our healthcare professionals, the frontline people, not necessarily just pharmacists, but uh, others as well. And maybe sometimes our uh, thought leaders uh, talking about vaccine hesitancy of their own concerns and how do we manage that um, as uh, a regulator or a ministry or an oversight body, or maybe even the manager in that location. Uh, any thoughts from the panel on, on some best practices or some ideas on how that could be managed? And I'll be looking for some hands. Andy, please, thank you. And then we have John. Well, I'll help, help out with what first came to my mind and that we'll get the others time to think. Um, I know that we had some hospital pharmacist managers across New Zealand who reached out to us at the ministry and they were having difficulties with some of their staff who were, um, in those early days, they were unsure about the, the science and how quick the vaccines were developed. So we, um, we uh, engaged in conversations with them and and provided them with concise, um, uh, pla plain English um, uh, summaries of, of the, the evidence and the science and how the vaccines were developed. So we, if, we like, if you like, we fast tracked them to simple answers to these questions. And I know that they workshopped them amongst themselves before they had the conversations with their staff members um, and they found that valuable. Very helpful, Andy, thank you. Uh, John, I recognize your hand. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Ron. And <laughs> I'm not saying I've got answers to this question, but some thoughts that came to mind is that um, vaccination will not be something that's done by every pharmacist in every pharmacy. Circumstances will vary, uh, your patient group, uh, the nature of your practice. And so uh, there should be plenty of opportunity for people who, pharmacists, who are, are uh, hesitant about vaccination to work somewhere else other than uh, a pharmacy that is committed to vaccination. But the other thing that I would say to all pharmacists is that we're here to care for patients. It's patient-centred care, and patient choice is paramount to that. Our great obligation is to do what's in their interest by providing them the best information available. And that has to be evidence-based information. And there's a lot of information out there about vaccination, a lot of information out there about all parts of healthcare, but you have to recognise the, 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 the evidence value of that information and, and rely upon reliable sources of, of, of evidence. So I think um, anybody who is a, a health practitioner who is not of by themselves supportive of vaccination really has to think carefully about their professional obligation if they try to convince their patients of that belief when it is not aligned with the evidence 
the broader uh, evidence for vaccination. Uh, great point, John. Thank you so much. And uh, I have Michael with his hand up. And then I think our time is getting a little bit on the shorter end. And we'll turn it back to Prisa after this uh, to close it down. But before we do that, John or Michael, please. My first reaction, not being a pharmacist, was to say fire them. Uh, however, uh, look, vaccine hesitancy is quite a healthy thing. You know, I think everybody should be prepared to uh, question. Uh, evidence is uh, incredibly important, but also, of course, uh, the registration, uh, professional registration systems uh, really need to make sure that uh, best practice based on the evidence is working. And if we have uh, any health professional who is um, standing out against the evidence, you go through a process and if the process doesn't work, then you actually do deregister them. And, uh, and I think that actually makes the whole, that element of profession, whatever it is in the health profession, uh, that much more respected. And in some ways I think it's probably con considered a bit harsh, but really uh, in the end, it's not so much about the health professional, it's about the health outcome of the community. A great point, Michael. And I think there's a, a planning process involved in this as well. As if you're talking about an individual on the front line, that uh, the, the person in charge, the pharmacist in charge, or an, a colleague uh, raises that question, like, it seems like you're a bit negative on this. And then there's steps take to, are to be taken to prevent uh, that misinformation, perhaps, or that what might be potentially deemed as misconduct from spreading further. And you want to do some uh, preventative upfront work on, on, in those types of situations as well. That's my Ron, just old you go on, Yeah, Gonzalo did put in the chat room earlier that toolkit for pharmacists with regard to vaccine confidence, and I think that's a, a really important uh, tool that is uh, that's sitting there for everybody. Great, thank you, Michael. Appreciate that. Okay, uh, Prisa, it'll be over to you, please. Great, right. thank you very much. Um, We've learned a lot from the panel this evening or today, depending on your time. Um, we've learned a lot about the regulatory landscape, um, as well as some of the funding models and how they support pharmacists involvement in vaccination, as well as just vaccination in general. We've also heard about some good examples of best practice, as well as some challenging situations, um, and also looked at the switching from the pandemic to the endemic. I think it's also been great to hear around um, people's experiences, but also have a good understanding of, you know, vaccination as a pharmacy delivered service could actually pave the way and set a good foundation for some future services that pharmacy can provide. Um, and we need the environment to be supportive as well as pharmacy itself to be able to do the, the right job, but in, in a multi-professional setting with other healthcare professionals. So I like to thank our panel um, for the time they've taken, the thoughtful responses and the breadth of experience um, that they've drawn on to give us some good information and educated us along the way tonight. And I'd like to thank my co-chair, Ron, um, for very ably asking the questions and um, guiding this session. And of course, FIP for organizing this and GSK as our sponsor. Um, and thank you to the audience. Um, I hope you enjoyed this and gained quite a lot from this as, as much as I have also gained from this. So thank you again. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you, everybody.